So to open up this event, I'd like you to perform a little mental experiment. Think about the phone sitting in your pocket right now. So with this crowd, the chances are that uh, it can handle phone calls, text messages, email, variety of computing tasks that even 10 years ago would have required a big, bulky desktop computer. Uh, if you think about it, you've basically got a little slice of Star Trek in your pocket compared to what a telephone was, say, 100 years ago, you know, a rotary dial or black and white television from even 50 years ago. <clears throat> now think about your faucet or your shower. Think about how they compared to 100 years ago. Chances are they basically look the same. Uh, think about some of the big water projects that allow Southern California to even exist as a population center. Aside from some electric pumps and some hydroelectric stuff, which is also 100 years old, uh, those systems basically look almost exactly like aqueducts that the Romans built in the south of France and in Spain 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> so finally, I want you to think about this. If you had to choose between which you'd want to live without, your phone or water, which would it be? Right. So obviously, we have a life-giving, economy-building, precious resource uh, to which we have applied shockingly little of our innovative prowess over the past 2,000 years. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about how to change that uh, and how we might uh, be able to use the magic of uh, markets and technology uh, to create a world in which we both manage our water supplies more sustainably uh, and at the same time meet everybody Uh, California is in a drought. Uh, our region in particular is not doing well. Um, if we don't get a whole lot of rain, we are probably looking at water use restrictions in many parts of uh, our county here. And even if we do get a whole lot of rain, uh, it's going to take us several years of good rain to just get back to normal in terms of recharging groundwater and some of our major reservoirs. Uh, but what you really came here tonight to do is to hear about how you can make money off of this. So let me put it in terms that resonate with the business and technology crowd. Right here in your own backyard, you have a $4.1 billion industry with a B uh, that is undoubtedly going to be disrupted over the next two decades. That $4.1 billion is the total value of the agricultural output of the Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo County area uh, in 2012. And water is a major cost driver of agriculture as well as a lot of other things like development. Uh, but globally speaking, about three quarters of all fresh water goes toward agriculture. And let me tell you what the lead economist at Citigroup has to say about that. Little of this is measured and metered. Essentially, none of it is priced in a way that incentivizes farmers to use water efficiently. At most, a small charge is imposed to make a contribution to the capital cost of agricultural irrigation infrastructure, and the scarcity value of water itself is never brought home to farmers. Not necessarily true in this region. Anyway, this has to end if we're to avoid an environmental disaster. Yes, the pricing of agricultural use of water at its full, long-run social marginal cost will increase the cost of food and agricultural commodities. It should and it is long overdue, end quote. Now I want you to think about that and remember that's not a radical environmental group. Uh, that is the lead economist at one of the world's biggest banks. So what this means is we're going to have to start optimizing the flow and use of water the way that we now optimize the flow of ones and zeros and the use of electricity. The good news is that we have many of the tools right at our disposal in terms of incredible sensor technologies, wireless communications, powerful cloud computing to crunch all the data, some of which you're going to hear about uh, this evening. And I just want you to imagine you know, a, a world in which local water rights could be bought and sold on a daily or even hourly basis to optimize the use in terms of who gets it and what price they pay. So uh, we've got Mark Cram, a great scientist and entrepreneur who's working on a software suite that could lead to uh, the monitor needed to making some of this happen. Uh, and then we've also got a great set of speakers who can outline uh, some of the legal, environmental, and then day-to-day -day business challenges of current agriculture uh, for us. So without further ado, Mark Cram. Thank you very much for that introduction, Steve. That was great. Um, we all know that without water, we don't have economy. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I don't know if we can point to um, any exceptions to that. Um, I, the objective of this presentation is not necessarily to scare everybody, uh, although there might be a couple of frightening slides there, uh, but really to talk about this in an open way to see how we might be able to reach our objective. And our objective is obviously to achieve some sort of sustainability. And what does that mean? That means 
understanding what our needs are going to be, understanding what the available water supplies are, how to get to them, and how to maintain them. And so without further ado, I'll just uh, dive in a little bit. So we've been studying a lot of uh, challenges on a global scale. Uh, you probably can't see that very clearly, but I just wanted to articulate that this has been going on for the last couple of years where we see all over the world people are worried about water supply and how it impacts uh, not only agriculture, not only um, fisheries, but also uh, even security. Um, a lot of people might not know this, but the um, Arab Spring, uh, many people cite water shortages as one of the leading causes of that. Um, the uh, wells were going dry, so the price of produce was skyrocketing, and it finally hit a flash point. It's a lot more complicated than that, but water did play a role in that. So in the US, we also are facing some challenges. The General Accounting Office in 2003 said that within 10 years, the majority of our states are gonna be water unsustainable. They didn't include, uh, out of those 36 states, it didn't include California or New Mexico. So we can basically say that about three quarters of the United States would be water unsustainable. Many believe that this prediction actually came true a few years earlier than expected. The Ogallala Aquifer, which is the most important water body in the United States, arguably, 30% uh, of our uh, irrigation water comes from there, will be depleted by 70% within our children's lifetime. Um, we've got groundwater contamination as well. That's actually uh, the area that I've been focusing on most until I recognized how serious this water supply issue was. Um, but recently a report came out from National Academy of Sciences that said 126,000 uh, sites that they deem complex uh, will never be uh, uh, remediated, or at least in the next 50 years. So they're throwing their arms up and wondering what we're going to do about that. Here is uh, a map that shows some very important water bodies, uh, groundwater uh, basins, uh, actually, and it, it talks about the cumulative groundwater depletion between 1900 through 2008. Uh, the Ogallala is prominently displayed in the middle there. And for those of you that can't read those numbers, uh, the dark red is where you've got 150 to 400 cubic kilometers of depletion. Cubic kilometers. I mean, we're talking about incredible amounts. These are like oceans that have drained, okay? On a local level, a lot of us are pretty familiar with the, the issues here. We've got great panelists here as well that are uh, very, very um, uh, informed about these types of issues. Uh, we just learned on December 31st that 2013 was the driest year on record in California. Uh, in Paso Robles, uh, there were some significant observations about groundwater depletion, and there was an emergency ordinance uh, that was implemented. So people had to turn off their extraction wells. That's pretty draconian. We don't see that happen too many times. As, particularly in an area like Paso Robles that has, uh, you know, prime wine area, right? Um, so there were pumping restrictions, and now they're talking about maybe creating a water district. If they can't come to the table and make a, a, a necessary agreement, it'll probably end up uh, with Brownstein uh, litigating something here, right? So um, speaking of that, Santa Maria Basin uh, was adjudicated in 2008. Um, and then there was an appeal that failed uh, shortly thereafter. So we're talking about 16 years of a court battle before people determined what the allocations would be. In Las Posas, just uh, down in Ventura area, they had a great idea of taking water that was available during very wet years and then storing it in the subsurface. Um, but there was really very little way that they can determine the full capacity. And as a, a result, they spent $150 million and uh, the, the, the system actually leaked, so they didn't meet their objectives. So now we're met with the change in plans, if you will. Um, in California alone, there have been 22 adjudicated basins. I think uh, Russ has probably been involved in most of those, right? Uh, okay, so we are looking at drought and low reservoirs. This graphic here shows uh, quite a few things. Uh, the red lines that you see in those bar graphs uh, indicate the historic average. So you can see this was 
uh, as of December 21st um, in 2013. So in many cases, we're less than the average, but far less. In some cases, we're about half of the average. Uh, last I heard, we we're at about uh, three and some change inches of rain in this area. Um, the state water projects that are being considered are incredibly expensive, $25 billion in a decade. They're talking about building tunnels from Northern California to get water where we need it in the southern part. The population's increasing. It's actually stabilizing a little bit, but we still have to consider it's a moving target, right? So if we can meet the needs for today, that it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. We have to anticipate what those needs are gonna be. For the first time in the history of our country, Food production limitations are not based on land limitations. It's based on water. And that just happened within the last few years. That's a significant transition. And then you have competition, not only among municipalities, agriculture, energy, hydraulic fracturing, many others. If you look at the percent average precipitation up until December 21st from uh, October 1st through that time, that's one of the prime uh, initial raining uh, areas of, of the fall to winter season uh, were well below average. Um, I think Bakersfield is, is doing really well because they had maybe an inch of rain, right? So um, we're very low. Uh, there are discussions I saw today, Department of Water Resources and the governor is about to declare a state of emergency. Uh, so the timing of this uh, presentation is, it couldn't have been better, I guess, right? Um, there are lack of sustainability policies. We see a lot of programs that have that word sustainable or sustainability in the title. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you know, uh, you're just gonna take a, a half approach, a half solution approach. It really means ensuring sustainability, ensuring that you'll meet those demands, those targets. One of the key issues is that groundwater extraction rates are not required. So if you're leasing land and you're growing crops, you do not have to report how much you're extracting, okay? And that's our bank account as well. And if we're all extracting from that and we don't have to say how much we're reporting, you can kind of see where our, this story might end. Um, we don't have a clear understanding of the yields that these basins will uh, offer. And so in essence, the data is incomplete. Um, plus you have things that I know Steve's really uh, interested in, which is commodity trading. So they have water banking, and you can actually go on the exchange. Uh, Goldman Sachs, if you're not um, you know, scared enough from some of these slides, Goldman Sachs is now involved in water trading. Okay, now where is that? Where's that acre foot? Where's that thousand acre foot aliquot? There's not really an accounting system that's set up that has quality control. Okay, uh, this is 93101. If you go on GeoTracker, you can see all the sites here, there, has, there are 175 different sites where there have been contamination released that have potentially hit or might have hit groundwater. So you've got these types of things to contend with on top of that. Okay, it's not all doom and gloom. We could solve these problems. You know, we've, we've done things that are a lot more challenging than this. It's all about getting the information and doing the right thing with that information, making the right decisions. We have to start somewhere. And there are two primary categories that I wanted to focus on. One is decreasing the use, okay? Another is increasing the amount of supplies that we have, right? So when we're talking about uh, decreasing the use, you know, we can become more efficient. Our utility structures are, are, are very outdated. Um, I've heard and read about uh, inefficiencies in our water distribution system that range from 10 to 40% of waste of the total amount of water supply. That's pretty profound. Why is it 10 to 40? Why don't we know how much it is? Why can't we make it zero? We can make it zero. I know we can. It's just a matter of priorities, how we want to spend our money. Um, conservation, we can optimize the application of water, et cetera. Um, in terms of increasing supply, there's some folks here in the audience that, uh, like Brad Newton, that uh, uh, focuses on some of these things, and, and Hugo, who hopefully will show up, will, has uh, done a lot of work in here as well, where not only do you have better management uh, tools, but you also are taking stormwater that would normally run off and then diverting that into the groundwater so you increase your local supplies. 
uh, that's a really nice way to get sort of a feedback loop. Because if you think about the development of a city, there are a lot of surfaces now that are impermeable. So before those roads and those buildings were there, that water would infiltrate into the water, much more, uh, much more percentage of that, and not become runoff. So in terms of decreasing the use, uh, we have many ways to increase efficiencies. There are leak sensors, there are smart sensors and meters. Um, you've got soil moisture sensors. I had a discussion earlier about uh, some of these types of technologies. You can have precision agriculture. So you wait till the soil moisture gets to a certain range of conditions, and then you engage the, uh, the irrigation instead of irrigating every day at the same time. Um, or you could even do precision ag where you only irrigate where it's needed, okay? Um, in terms of conservation, there are many different things that, that can be implemented. Um, Hugo was involved when we had the, the drought situation in the mid-90s, and he helped instill the price block tiers. Uh, if you guys, uh, when you go and you see your water bill next time, take a look, especially if you have a, a family, right, where you've exceeded a certain threshold level. If you go above that level, then the price that you pay for water is a little bit higher for the amount that goes up. That, and there, I think there are three, maybe even four tiers. Fortunately, I haven't seen the fourth one, so maybe we don't use as much water. But you can have cisterns. Here's a, a rainwater storage tank, so you can have your gutters that go directly to some storage. You know, there's some nuances, and you have to make sure that it's clean, and, and depending on what you want to use it for, you know, there's some things that you can learn about. But there's some great companies, even in town here, that specialize in those types of things. Um, in terms of big data, there are a lot of groups that are trying to figure out how to get involved, right? Not just by building utilities because they have to wait for Congress or somebody else to pass some uh, measure that would lead to construction. Um, in terms of uh, uh, what, what they found psychologically, uh, a lot of these entities that were doing this research is they said, you know, if people know that they're impacting their neighbor, or if they know what their water use is relative to their neighbor's water use, that's going to impact their decisions, okay? And so some of these groups basically just report what you're using. They look at, you can see your neighbor's meters. And that actually has been proven to have a positive impact. Um, you might even be able to determine whether or not there's a leak that you didn't know about, and you're paying for that. You're paying for that water. Um, there are other things as well. You can have sensors that actually can detect where there are leaks. So th this is a big business. Uh, there are certain nations that are leading the charge in this. I'd, I'd put Israel at top of that. Um, for some reason, maybe because they're out in the desert, they've um, developed a lot of the technology that we use in the United States. So in terms of increasing and optimizing the supplies, we're talking about better management. I keep on hitting on data, right? What kind of data? And science-based decisions. We have some great scientists, and they make these beautiful models, but quite often the models end up giving us, uh, point us in a direction of a decision, but um, the data that we have is typically limited. So we have to give more information, collect more information so that we can make better decisions. These models make pretty pictures, but they're not often calibrated. You can't make a prediction and then evaluate that prediction very easily and compare that and say, well, you know, we tried. You know, I mean, that's typically where we're at right now, where people make a prediction and nobody even tests it out. They just had a pretty slide, but okay, you made a big decision. Las Posas Basin is a perfect example. They made some assumptions about that, but we needed to really test those. Um, you can look at water level. You can look at meters. You can use software to crunch all this information and make it very efficient. Um, you can look at what's referred to as storage change. That's where you have changes in water, but it's like a bank account. You can actually account for how much has changed between any two selected time steps. I'm going to show you an example of that. On the, the, the supply side for increasing the, the, the supply, they've got diversions and spreading areas. The Freeman Diversion Area, if you want to do a nice field trip, is just down in Ventura. It's been there for decades. It's very efficient. It's loading the aquifer so that we keep salt water from coming ashore in the areas where uh, agriculture could be impaired um, in the, the, the Port Wainimi area and the Oxnard area. Um, Stormwater infiltration, I mentioned, I'll show you a couple of examples of that. But again, you want to still understand the impacts of those decisions and those designs. So you've got water banking. This, again, gets back to the Goldman Sachs issue. Um, and then you obviously want some quality control and some accounting. 
So here's an example of um, something that I've been working on quite a bit in the last several years. Many people have probably seen this slide, where we automate some of the processing of this data instead of manually crunching it. So we have field sensors, and they could be in any medium, but right now our talk is, on, is focused on water. Um, we can have these in the subsurface, monitoring water levels, sending information wirelessly uh, to a cloud-based platform, and it gets processed. What does that processing mean? You're making images, you're updating models, you can do other types of uh, 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 calculations like how much did the groundwater change in terms of level and volume. Um, you can blend it with historical data. So say that you didn't have sensors, but you have years and years of data, because right? a lot of agencies do. Um, you can blend those if you didn't have the sensors earlier, or you could just use the data from the database. But it, 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 it's a very nice, efficient way to come up with conclusions and decisions. And what we wanted to focus on was something that was intuitive to all the stakeholders. Uh, guys like Hugo and, and other folks like myself and others, we're used to seeing you know, points like that and squiggly lines. But that's not really intuitive to a lot of the people that have to make these decisions. So these contour images, these heat maps, if you will, I think we've been conditioned to be able to appreciate these and understand these intuitively, especially if it's moving, because we, we watch the weather, right? We've seen uh, nice weather maps. That's a perfect example of that. Or maybe some people know what topography uh, maps look like. So what we want to do is have intuitive visualizations so that we can make the right decision. So what we did was we developed a way to take that data and automatically generate those kinds of images. And we can embed that into websites, dashboards, we can create custom dashboards. Um, and we can even, we've made a, a web app I can access from my phone or from an iPad. So any kind of uh, web supported device, you can access that information. And what's nice about it being on the web is that you can have people collaborating from disparate locations. So we've had um, situations where we're doing work overseas and we had people from multiple countries uh, uh, collaborating simultaneously. So what we're trying to do is visualize a lot of data really rapidly and even computations. So not just the raw data, but also we, we apply that to something. Um, we can aggregate, as I mentioned, you can take data that's in a database and mix it with sensor data, et cetera. But we can engage alerts, so we can ping people that are responsible. Better yet, we can set up rules and we can engage controllers. So if a well is pumping unsustainable, we can go back to that well automatically and turn it off. Or if it's a variable speed pump, we can slow down that rate. And we can do that automatically and it's documented, okay, so it's archived. Um, I'm going to go through what I refer to as GBES, Groundwater Basin Storage Tracking. So as you know, we can monitor water levels. We can monitor the changes between any two selected times, okay? If we know something about the geology, then we can run a calculation that estimates how much storage has changed, the volumetric change there. Um, this is what I would like to see Goldman Sachs adopt before they sell uh, water on our behalf. Um, and uh, if there's any need for response, fine, or historical record. So what you see on the upper left here is a contour image that is of water level, where the blue color is the highest water level, and then the, reddest, the red color is the lowest level, okay? That's just based on sensors that are deployed where you see those little yellow tick marks. Those yellow, not tick marks, but the, the, the bullseyes. Those are sensors that are deployed in wells. And every time that uh, uh, triggers, uh, you see another tick mark that represents another time step, okay? So you can go and do a playback loop and see how things change over space and time. Now you can select any two of those, you can change the channel to water level change, and you can then see where the changes are most dramatic and least dramatic. In this case, the most dramatic upwards is the blue, so there was an increase in water level in that location. And then there was the, the least amount, or there was a decrease where it's red, okay? Now again, if we know something about the geology, we can compute the volumetric change spatially so we can see where the most volume change occurred, but also we get a cumulative estimate, okay? And this is a rough cut that is provisional, but it gives you a good estimate and then you can later go in and decide which time steps you wanna drill deeper if you wanna use more comprehensive models. 
Another system that Hugo and I developed is uh, about sustainability. And this, I believe, is the proper use of the word sustainability. What we're trying to do is, is determine target objectives, okay? The example I'm gonna show you is where you have wells that are pumping adjacent to a river or a stream. And the objective is to meet the negotiated flow rate between some regulator and some other folks that are responsible for maintaining that, okay? And so essentially what we do is we um, put meters on the wells, we know how much they're pumping, and then we know something about the geologic system, and every time data is collected, we compare the amount that they're pumping to the amount that our model says is sustainable. We'll maintain that water level above that threshold. We could do the same thing for groundwater basins, like what happened in Paso Robles. So we can say, okay, this well is pumping so much that it's gonna make their neighbor's well go dry. Or in the coastal area, you can protect from seawater intrusion as well. So you're setting these objectives in your model. So here's kind of a, uh, I'm not an artist, I apologize, but um, here's a cross section, if you will, of an area where you've got a well that's pumping adjacent to a river. So uh, there's a steelhead there, that's what a steelhead looks like, I think. Um, but you have QR, Q sub R, that's the flow rate that's going you know, through that, that reach, if you will, that, that cross section of the river uh, in, in that particular reach. Now, you can see this, this line that kind of bends over. It looks almost like an asymptote there. Um, that is the water level. And this is, you know, conjecture. But essentially what happens typically is if you're pumping at a sufficient enough amount, you're going to draw water towards that well. And so that water level next to the well is going to be depressed. It's called a cone of depression. And so what we're looking at is little Q is pulled out of big Q. Now, if you have a bunch of these wells, located along a reach within a river, then what your, your target objective is to always make sure that big Q minus all the little Qs is greater than what you determined is the sustainability, the sustainable rate, okay? If not, then you can do something about it. So here's an example where um, for each well, we have two histograms or two bars, okay? So the bar on the left is essentially the amount that we're measuring that you're pumping from those wells. The bar on the right, the, the, the purple bar, the red bar essentially, that's the amount that the model says, that's the maximum sustainable amount that you could pump from that well. And if you exceed that, it changes colors, it calls somebody, it turns the well off, whatever you want it to do, right? Um, you can use this not only in a real-time situation, but for planning purposes. So for those of you that have wells on your, on your property or you've uh, been affiliated with folks that do, typically what people say is, I want a well, I need water, and make, put the biggest pump you can in there, right? I want to take as much out of there as possible. They're not really considering what those impacts might be. Well, here's a way that you can do that. So in this situation, we were using data from a couple of st a stream down south of here. Well one is located adjacent to the stream in the upstream side. Well two is a little downstream from that. Well three is well downstream of that. And so we said, okay, we'll turn these wells on at the same time and we'll see what happens. And we're pumping initially at 5,000 cubic meters per day for each well. Okay, so it takes some time to reach equilibrium. Finally, it reached equilibrium and then we increased the amount of the second well to 15,000, okay? Look what happened. It made not only the second well go unsustainable, but that last well as well. So then we said, well, you know, let's back off a little bit. We backed off a little bit, and everything's sustainable, and you're pulling as much water out as you can. So before somebody issues a well permit, I'd love for them to run this kind of model and determine what the maximum amount is to design that well. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap this up. The, um, in terms of infiltration, um, there are a lot of really great uh, uh, folks out there that are doing this kind of work, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And uh, I'm very impressed with uh, what I've seen happen over the last 10, 15 years or so. Um, when you route stormwater to groundwater, you get a lot of benefits out of that. You have flood control, 
right? You cut down that signal, so you protect infrastructure and people. Um, you reduce the runoff. So in a coastal zone like here, you would have less pollution going to the ocean. That's nice. You obviously increase your local water supplies if you design it correctly. A couple of other things that people don't really think about is there's an energy benefit as well. So if you've got state water, let's say you're in Los Angeles, okay, and you're getting state water, it takes a lot of energy to move that water from Northern California. If you reduce the amount that you need to pull from there, not only do you reduce the energy, but you reduce the air uh, pollution to run those pumps to get over to Hatchapi and the hills over there. Um, so that's another, it's like a win, 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 right? Um, but proceed with caution because you can introduce contaminants or if there are already contaminant plumes that exist, you may actually impact the direction of flow. And if those were already contained under other programs, you may exacerbate that issue. Um, and you could cause structural damage as well. If the water levels come too high, you could ruin foundations, et cetera. So you have to be pretty careful about this and it takes uh, a lot more than what I can present here uh, to do this correctly. Um, but you can see that you can actually, uh, with the bioretention, you can cut off some of the contaminants that might be introduced. You can even open up uh, the, the passageway only after the first bit of rain goes so that the worst of the contaminants runs by. Um, but whenever you do that, I'm still saying you have to have some quality control. Use sensors, evaluate the quality, evaluate how much change has occurred, evaluate those flow directions, et cetera. So in, in summary, you know, we can do a lot better. There's a lot of areas where we can collect much more data and do many great things with that information. Um, we can essentially have a smart city. I know a lot of people are talking about that with the Internet of Things and, and a lot of other topics that folks are, are very uh, engaged with in this community. And uh, I, I believe that we can do a heck of a lot better than we're doing. I mean, we're in a, a situation right now, a management situation, uh, we're not in a, in a technology drought. We, we don't have enough water because of what's happening uh, that's a little bit outside of our control. But this was known. This has been predicted. And it's not the end. So we need to get very smart about it, and we should optimize and, and make our cities as, as smart as they can. Make them essentially run themselves with a little bit of help. Um, and that's pretty much all I had to share. Um, and next I'd like to bring up... Uh uh, Russ from uh, Brownson Hyatt. They are the top water law firm uh, in the state, in the nation, in the world. Um, but the, the interesting thing about water is that the economics of it are in part uh, determined by uh, the rights around it and how they're handled and what kind of incentives those give people. Uh, and Russ is an expert in that and is going to tell us a little bit about the legal framework uh, around water. I will talk a little bit about the uh, policy and law. It's a little bit short. I got about five, maybe 10 minutes, I'm not gonna dive too much into the, what would be an, an all evening, maybe all week, uh, long discussion of law, but um, we can talk a little bit about the policy and, and I can talk about a little bit of the things that are challenging from a legal and policy perspective uh, as we manage water resources in California. Uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a qualification, I put these slides together with the, my partner who was here and he has a, he has a knack for putting on some, some very, really disturbing slides at some points. He likes to catch your attention. If, if they're if one of those, it's his, not mine. <laughs> Everybody's heard this, this, this saying, I, I believe, the whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. But I want an uh, interesting point that I, um, many of you don't know, that it's always attributed to Mark Twain. It is definitively not a Mark Twain quote. However, there is a Mark Twain bourbon or whiskey. So, you know, there is a connection there. Um, my, my partner slides. <laughs> Uh, so water law and policy, uh, what are we talking about? What we're, we're getting at is who gets the water, and who or what in the ten, in, in sense of environment versus humans. Um, we have to balance those public and private interests. Um, I, and I, if I get a chance, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the, the property rights that exist in water rights versus the public overlay in the resource itself. It's, it's um, quite complex. Under what conditions, um, the management tools and options that are available, for managing water, uh, you know, we have legislation, special water districts, adjudication, they're all available tools um, for management. Um, the federal and state overlay, largely water law around the nation is a state-driven legal system um, with uh, occasional, uh, some uh, federal um, outliers. Um, 
local overlays, local politics come uh, extensively into management. Um, we can talk about land use policy, stakeholders. Prop 218 you may be familiar with is a proposition that requires that new taxes or any tax or, or special fee be proportional and have a nexus to uh, those to those paying it. Um, we were talking about tiered rates. There's actually an opinion out there that tiered rates might be a violation of Proposition 218. We'll see where that goes. That would be very challenging for incentivizing um, at least you know domestic consumption. Uh, challenging issues to say the least. Um, population growth um, projected to double um, from 20 from 1990 uh, levels by by 2050. If that's the case, as you said, we're not just managing for our existing demand, but we're going to have to get really creative to meet uh, demands in the future. There's a quick slide of the, uh, of the pl pumping and, um, and, and plumbing system in California. You have three really big projects, uh, maybe four when you throw in the Owens Valley that's run by LA, but Central Valley Project, which is a federal project, that's what you see in yellow there. State Water Project uh, in, in red or rust color. And then you have um, what is green is a local projects, but the big one there is the Colorado River. And the interesting thing to see there is that um, effectively all of them are over allocated. Uh, when you see there in the state water project, 4.1 um, million acre feet a year of table A, that's what's allocated to the 29 different contractors, although only 2.5 or roughly 60% of that is deemed today under current conditions, not factoring in climate change. Um, to be reliable. Colorado River, uh, they allocated 16 million acre feet a year of between the, uh, the, the states on the, on the Colorado River. Uh, it looks now that long term projections uh, are that it's about 15 million, so about a million acre feet of over allocation on the Colorado River. Um, so we not only have, have challenges um, in terms of population, but what we thought we had is not quite there. I don't mean to from the, the doom and gloom, but this is the, the realities that we're dealing with. Uh, one of the biggest issues that you'll hear a lot about today is the, the bottleneck of the uh, Bay Delta system. Um, it's this, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the Sacramento River is the big arrow coming down. That's 84% of the water that's coming out of the Delta, and then about 25% leaves on the, the, the brown arrow at the bottom. And so we're really moving water from north to south. You have about two-thirds of your precipitation in the northern half of the state, two-thirds of the population in the southern half of the state, state water project being a big, large part of that, particularly uh, in the municipal consumption side, ag as well. Uh, and the big discussion is how to manage that without impacts to endangered species in the habitat. That's a picture of the Delta smelt. You've probably heard of it. Um, and other uh, salmonoids and other other um, challenging environmental problems. One of the concepts is, is the two tunnels that Mark alluded to at a price tag of, of 25 billion, and it seems to grow about a billion every year as we proceed. But um, the, the, the plan came out, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, just uh, uh, the final draft EIR came out just last month, and so um, conflicting area. Um, climate change, it's happening uh, it, it, without any question in terms of California water supply. Uh, and this, what this graph shows is the late season runoff, which is where we really manage a ton of our water is in our snowpack to the extent it melts earlier and runs off in either rain or melting snow earlier in the year. We don't get the benefit it wastes to the ocean. So with that change, we're going to have to find new dynamics, things like capturing and groundwater recharge that Mark was alluding to, um, conjunctive use, absolutely critical if we're going to address a changing, a changing climate. Um, Groundwater, I uh, know what more to say that Mark hasn't said. It's a perplexing issue, particularly in part because it's effectively unmanaged in California. Um, whereas in the state, in, in, the, in our state, surface water is, um, requires a permit if you're an appropriator, which are the large users, uh, both appropriators and landowners. We have a com competing system in California, a legal rights regime can pump whatever they want until and unless there is some um, adjudication or cabining or, um, if you will, capping of the rights. One way to think about it is, and the classic way to think about it is the tragedy of the commons. This may be elementary for, for many of you, but the uh, basic principle Garrett Hardin wrote back in his classic journal is when an entity, a user, can take all the gains of an additional unit of use and transfer the, the, the cost amongst all users, the incentive is over to overuse. And, and give you a little classic 
So, you know, a few cows, more on the pasture, more and more and more until you have a very unhappy cow. So the concept, um, the, way, one, the way to deal with this, um, either through regulation or through um, private separation, if you will think cap and trade, as we hear in the climate, is to cap the quantities of use and then potentially trade amongst them. So you give each cow its own small pasture, if you will. We do that in water rights, too. Um, we adjudicate. Uh, individuals get in the individual pieces of, of, of the whole, the commons. They can't um, uh, exude their, their costs onto the commons at, at, at large. They're able to transfer and make optimal use of the resource. Um, Rob, my partner, put the slide in. He loves it. The, uh, it's a good graph of smartness and right choice. We're trying to get out there in the, the, the northeast corner. Unfortunately, we're too often there in the southwest corner. Of, of making not only not intelligent, but also unlucky or non-right choices. So we can talk more about what those are. That's all for my slides this evening. Uh, next, I'd like to bring up John Christ from the Ventura County Farm Bureau. Uh, and he has the distinction of really having uh, his, his uh, fing finger on the pulse of what's actually going on with some of these big users, especially in Ventura County. Uh, in Ventura County alone, uh, the, the agricultural output is worth $1.9 billion in 2012, and a lot of that was strawberries, and a lot of those guys are uh, bracing for a trickle. Uh, compared to what they're used to uh, this year. So we are, I mean, it's, there's no question, we're going to see a heavy economic impact to our region uh, just off of that one industry and then this one place. So uh, please welcome John Christ of the Ventura County Farm Bureau. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I usually do PowerPoints, but for five minutes, it's not worth the trouble <laughs> to me. So um, first of all, I noticed by the general lack of jeans, boots, and plaid shirts in the, the, in the room that we don't have a lot of farmers here. So, so let me explain just really briefly what, what the Farm Bureau of Ventura County does. We are a private nonprofit advocacy organization. Uh, our role is to represent the interests of the agricultural community, the agricultural industry in Ventura County in legislative, regulatory, uh, political arenas. We do a lot of public education and outreach, try to help people understand uh, what exactly it is that farmers do and why it matters. Uh, you know, you'd think that if people eat, they wouldn't need to be told that, but uh, it, it helps to explain to the urban population in our county uh, what it is that farmers do and, and, and why they do it. Uh, agriculture in Ventura County, is, as Stephen said, it's, a, it's about a $2 billion a year crop value. That's the gross value. That's not profits. That's, that's the value as it leaves the farm. Uh, profits are considerably smaller than that. Uh, when you calculate the indirect and induced economic activity that's associated with it, it bumps it up closer to $3 billion. Uh, a year in Ventura County. Uh, employs about 43,000 people. That's a considerable, uh, considerable part of our employment base in Ventura County. What we do in Ventura County from an agricultural standpoint is very, very high value uh, products for sale in the fresh market. And one of the reasons that we focus so exclusively on things like strawberries and raspberries and lemons and avocados is we're one of the most expensive places in the world to farm. Um, it costs more to lease an acre of prime farmland for a year in Ventura County than it does to buy an acre of farmland almost everywhere else in the United States. Um, that's a very, very high sort of basement that you have to, you have to rise above if you're going to make any money. Um, contrary to, to yeah, I'm going to disagree with the, with the city economist, uh, it's not a, a blanket statement that agricultural water is never priced in a way that encourages efficiency. That's just not true. In some places, I would say, yeah, if you're paying $12 an acre foot for your water in Yuma, Arizona, that's probably not going to encourage uh, 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 economizing and efficiency. If you're paying $1,200 an acre foot for water in San Diego, what it does encourage is people to stump their avocado trees um, because you simply cannot make a living growing crops when you have to pay $1,200 an acre foot for water. And there's all kinds of different uh, levels in between those two things. Um, but one of the things that really is important to understand about agricultural economics when we talk about the potential role of, of price signals and so on in affecting behavior, particularly when it comes to water use, water consumption, um, is that unlike most manufacturers, and that's kind of what farmers are, they're manufacturing a, an organic product out in the field, that's where their factory is, but that's essentially what they're doing. Um, they don't get to set the price that they sell that commodity for. That's set by the market, and it's largely driven backwards from the retail end. 
So, you know, 70 cents of every dollar you spend on food gets sucked up somewhere in the value chain between the retailer uh, and the wholesaler. By the time it trickles back to the farmer, they're getting like 14 cents on the dollar, and that's to cover everything and make, make a profit. So without the ability to pass increased costs on directly, they're price takers, not price makers in, in, the, uh, in the marketplace, um, increased input costs, such as rising water prices, uh, basically decreases their profit margin. Um, they can't adjust their, their sale price to reflect that. So it does drive cropping pattern changes. Um, one of the things uh, we've seen in over years in Ventura County, and, and this is common in, in lots of places with high uh, production costs, is a constant evolution toward ever higher value crops, whatever you can uh, generate the most, uh, the most dollars per acre, uh, because you've got to cover fairly expensive water by many standards, three to, three to four hundred dollars an acre foot. Um, you've got very high energy costs, you've got very um, high regulatory compliance costs in this part of the world. Uh, and that, that really, really ridiculous high land value um, that, that you've got to cover. So it drives decisions such as that. Um, we do have what I would say is a weird combination of extremely inefficient and extremely efficient irrigation practices in Ventura County. Um, take, for example, strawberries. It's our number one crop. We produced $700 million worth of strawberries in 2012. Uh, it's about a third of the state's production comes out of the Oxnard area. Um, takes about 40 inches of water a year to grow a strawberry crop. Last year we got five inches of rain on the Oxnard Plain. So you got to make all the difference up with, with, with irrigation. Um, but again, the, you know, the ability to pass increased costs on is, is extremely limited. We are almost entirely dependent from an agricultural standpoint in Ventura County on groundwater. So this discussion about better better use and management of groundwater is extremely uh, critical for us in, in Ventura County. Uh, we can't afford to import state water. It's too expensive to, to grow on. Uh, we're relying almost, ex almost exclusively on local groundwater. And all of our basins are, again, uh, you know, it's a general statement. And generally, it's true that a lot of groundwater is not managed in California. But we manage it very carefully in Ventura County. We have uh, management structures, uh, legally established uh, management entities that uh, require reporting of extractions. Um, the uh, users pay an extraction charge to fund facilities that increase recharge uh, capacity. But all of those structures still put us in a place uh, where we're managing ourselves into a, into a groundwater overdraft crisis. Um, you know, the, the price signals can be overcome to some degree by these transitions to higher value crops such as strawberries and raspberries. But at the end of the day, that shrinking margin, um, you know, gives you, gives you relatively little to play with. But as I said, we're really efficient, but really inefficient. Strawberries, that number one crop, there's one month of the year, the month of October, typically. It's when the baby, the little transplants are established. Um, they're planted in the fields uh, through little holes cut in plastic tarp. And then we put miles and miles of overhead sprinklers out there and just water the daylights out of them. And about a lot of that water just simply runs off because it's falling on plastic. Um, once that period is over and the plant is established and has a root system, the irrigation switches to drip. All the strawberries are on drip systems, and there's no runoff. There's no waste at all. So I don't know whether that's efficient water use or not. You know, it's, it's <laughs> overall, probably. Um, many of our orchard crops similarly irrigated using microsprinklers. Um, no, no dry weather runoff. Um, that's about as efficient as you can get. Um, what you can't do is diminish the amount of water that the tree requires to live and produce a crop, no matter what the price signal is. Uh, you raise the price enough and the alternative is to take the trees out. Uh, you can't become more efficient than the trees demand you to, uh, when it comes to water use. Um, let's see, I could go on forever about, about farming in Ventura County, but I don't think I will. I think I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Stephen and we can get in some discussion here. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to kick things off with a few questions of my own, um, and then we will have some uh, microphones uh, coming around uh, the audience uh, so that you guys can uh, uh, tell us uh, your questions. But, um, you know, the, the one thing I wanted to start with, and anybody who wants to address it, uh, p please feel free, is, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about water as a commodity and trading it, uh, establishing market prices and, 
and uh, maybe figuring out how to use differing prices in different markets to, uh, to, to allow people to trade. But the unique thing about water as a commodity is unlike even other liquid commodities like oil, uh, there's a really significant environmental impact to removing it from its place of origin. So we can't take that two-thirds of the water and bring it to that two-thirds of the people uh, without some, some impacts that, uh, you know, both legal and so legally and socially we find unacceptable. So um, what can uh, or can't be done to address that aspect of water as a resource, that the, the fact that, that unlike oil or gold or iron or, or other things, it, it, there are impacts to taking it out of its place of origin? There, there's no question that, that uh, the, in the environmental and broader public interest of water as a resource, including recreation, in-stream flows, aesthetics, et cetera, is, is critical. Um, to its management and, and, and has to have significant due regard. Um, though there, I do believe there is opportunities, there's obviously plenty of opportunities where we can scalp that quantity which is not essential to a um, uh, baseline environment. Uh, the, the quantity that, for example, flows off during high storm events into the, to the oceans here in California uh, with very little environmental uh, benefit uh, beyond in comparison, I should say, to uh, dry period flows that are essential for migrating, uh, you know, steelhead and other riparian habitat, um, endangered species or otherwise. So uh, it, that is important to, to protect, but the, the, the critical issue is that um, you've got to create as much, I think, legal certainty along a side with the, the desire for adaptability, recognizing that those are two conflicting polar opposite sometimes issues, but you need to create enough legal certainty in order for, um, to manage the resource and, and, the, and the opportunities for transfers, which um, transfers have, have a good side, a very good side. Um, there are some certain challenges, but the good sides are they incentivize conservation, they reveal a true price of, of water, they reallocate water be, uh, you know, from, from those in need, uh, between those with, that have, have supplemental to those that need. And I think if you create legal regimes that provide legal certainty for that quantity of water which is supplemental to environmental needs, and you attempt to reduce the transaction costs to make that trading possible, um, that's where you have your sweet spot of opportunity. And just one more small point on it is that, is that when we ignore that, um, in water there are so significant transaction costs. And while a transfer of a thousand acre feet of water, in, 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 in my industry parlance, that's a very small quantity of water, could have you know, significant benefit. And if I combine a thousand, thousand acre feet transfers, it might have tremendous benefit. But the transaction cost of making that transfer, if you will, or that transaction occur, can be equal to a million acre foot transfer. Mm -hmm. And so those smaller transfers that may be of significant benefit don't happen. What happens is only the very large ones, like the, the San Diego IID transfer, largest in US history, uh, that was consummated um, in part by my, my law firm. Those happen because the gains of trade exceed the transaction costs. Find ways to minimize those transaction costs. What do you do? You do programmatic EIRs, assessments on, on a whole region. You make you know, parameters that are protective of the environment. If you fit within, it's rubber stamp, and it lowers the cost to, to create that. And then there is technology that you can use in there to, to, to match buyers and sellers uh, in an efficient way to, to, to maximize trends. Long-winded, sorry, but I think that's- That's what, okay. That's no, it's interesting because part of, I mean, part of the answer is, is you've got to have some of these monitoring things uh, where the transfer doesn't just necessarily happen as in, you know, we're putting in a pipeline and sending it from one place to another as much as uh, we're going to pump at this point upstream and then we're going to stop for a day so you can pump at this point downstream more than you would normally be able to, to you be able to pump beyond your level because I'm going to go below my level. Um, you, you know, John, one thing I had a question for you with all of this stuff, it's all very interesting and you can think about, you know, one rancher who's got a, a cattle high up on a hill and, and some uh, wine person who's got vines down below. Uh, but what's, what is it going to take um, in, in practical terms to get somebody 
to buy a system that would do this? Or, I mean, when is it going to be baked enough that, that a farmer who's got a, his or her just head down in the business trying to deal with market mm. conditions will say, hey, let's have a look at this. Uh, let's have a look at some of this, mm. this monitoring and, and allocation and pumping uh, monitoring uh, technology. Well, no, okay. Well, with, when we're talking about what are the growers looking for, whatever they're going to adopt, it's got to do one of two things. It's got to increase their profit margin or increase their yield or, you know, or maybe a third thing, decrease their input costs, mm -hmm. which itself would increase their profit margin. As I said in my opening remarks, they don't get to set the price they're going to sell for. So the only thing they can play around with is the amount that they produce and the amount of inputs that they use to produce it. So, you know, there is a tremendous incentive already in there to be as efficient as you can with all of your inputs, not just water, but, um, but fertilizer, you know, nutrients, every, everything, labor. Um, so any technology that improves a grower's ability to manage irrigation um, to the point where not a drop is being used that doesn't have to be used, that's contributing to their bottom line. So it's, you know, th there, is, there is a market there. And we do have growers already in Ventura County that some of the early adopters, they've got, you know, a variety of soil moisture sensors out there scattered throughout their, their operation. It transmits remotely to their computer sitting in their office, and they can, they can monitor their, their water use. Uh, it's tied into the Simmons weather system, so they know what the evapotranspiration rates are. They can adjust and, and really put the water on when it needs to be there and, and in the quantities that it needs to be. On the other hand, then we've got some on unpressurized gravity-fed systems <laughs> that furrow irrigate. So, yeah. which means, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you open a head gate at the top of the field and let water run across it until it gets to the far end, and then you shut it off. <laughs> um, not not hyper-efficient. But the cost of pressurizing those systems is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there, there's not enough money out there in the in the industry to pressurize those old, very efficient for their time, gravity feed, no energy involved um, systems. Um, so, really, it's got to again. I, 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 I'm not a lawyer, but I can be long-winded too. Um, <laughs> it's 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 got to it's got to affect the bottom line. And if it, and if the investment is outweighed by the return, they'll adopt it. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, speaking of long-winded and charging by the hour, there's a question I wanted to ask Mark. Mark, one of the, one of the really interesting things that your technology does is, is gives the all the variety of people who actually have to make this big decisions about water systems uh, a way to do it very quickly and a way to get, you know, a quick rough cut like animation and be like, oh, hey, here's something interesting. Let's go actually look at that. Um, but the problem that I would see with that is that this is an industry that's full of a lot of either consultants, uh, folks who work for, for agencies or whatnot, who generally charge by the hour. So how, how are you trying to go about selling a technology to them that's one of its main benefits is it drastically cuts down on the time, uh, on the time it takes um, you know, when, you go, when, you, when you go about going to market with this technology? Well, what we try to do is convince the consultants that uh, we work with that uh, there's a competitive advantage to adopt our policies and our, our technologies. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly what you just described exists. And uh, I think that, you know, we're going to see a shift fairly soon uh, where folks are just going to realize that they need to be more efficient. I mean, right now, um, you've got a lot of consulting firms that are actually laying people off, um, and but their clients still have obligations to uh, meet specific requirements. So um, we saw that we worked with uh, some federal government groups as well, and they were actually expressing those kinds of similar concerns, um, saying, well, you're asking us to get rid of these people, and we're saying, no, no, just use them a little bit to do different things, you know, and maybe more interesting things even. Um, and then, sure enough, the uh, stimulus package uh, dwindled and people lost their jobs anyhow, but the government still had the obligation to maintain um, you know, safe water resources, et cetera. So I think there's gonna be a transition. Right now, we're already seeing it, which is encouraging. Um, I, I wanted to also maybe um, address something that, that John mentioned that I thought was um, very fascinating. We, we see that groups like the group that John works with are, are doing as well as they can with efficiency. They're adopting technologies. They're, they're planning together in a consortia. They're opening, openly discussing this. They're even uh, uh, 
uh, confiding in larger groups. But it seems like there might be a disconnect. So how do we get from the farmer level to the greater level efficiently so that the impacts aren't always related to the crop that sells and the price on the market that's dictated by people outside of their uh, help um, and out of their control, but how does it um, really then be placed in a framework and a context that leads to a sustainable supply so that we don't ever have to worry about this economic impact that we're about to experience. Maybe it's through the legal path, but that disconnect needs to really, that bridge needs to be built, and I don't know the solution to that. I, I, would, ju I would just add that, you know, as I said, it, it, legal certainty is another way of, you can kind of think of it um, in one example, cap and trade, you know? Right. So figure out what the environment needs, your initial question, because we're not, I think we uh, as a society value that at least at a baseline level, or, you know, baseline plus, I should say. We're not gonna compromise that. And then what's supplemental, let's create the institutional and the legal certainty that allows us to maximize that the best. And there are so, I could, I'm not gonna go into them in depth, but there are so many um, uh, unique opportunities. There is um, dry, dry year following agreements between farmers who make can bring money back to farmers during those critical dry years when the municipal needs it and allow them on a long-term basis to continue to operate. There's groundwater, um, surface water substitution arrangements. Uh, I won't get into details other than to say there's many, many, many opportunities um, that we don't quite hit. I think I left off my final slide up there, which actually said, you know, it's a dysfunction a junction signpost. And the question is, you know, do we have a water crisis or a water management crisis? And mm -hmm. I would argue, um, with, you know, we have a lot of water that's come to the state, even in dry years, maybe not this critically dry year, but overall we have a lot of water uh, and there's ways to stretch it between wet and dry periods. We just have to figure out how to manage it better. And some of that, it, you know, what happens, last point is, is shortage drives institutional change. Mm -hmm. When the shortage occurs, that's when people get together, they figure out how to create the institutional and the technological fixes and you see that occurring. I just want to throw one, one additional thought in there, Stephen, and that's that whatever is done to address, you know, the water crisis is best done at a local or at best regional scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, there's this temptation to assume that because everybody in California is concerned about water, that it should be a state-driven, top-down um, process. There's just that built-in um, tendency in the system. But really, the conditions and the pressures and the stressors and the opportunities are, are localized, very, very hyper-localized. And um, so, you know, I would just throw that into the mix. I think we need to look to the local regions to, you know, bring the, bring the tools and the resources to bear there, but um, they have to be tailored to those conditions. Hmm. There, there, are, there are things the state can do from, a, you know, but intelligently to incentivize locals, but I, I firmly agree that water management is, is best played out at a local level. And, you know, the groundwater context, we always hear uh, state management of groundwater. And even if it were practical, which, or, or you know, it's not politically feasible. Um, so let's get on with figuring out how we manage groundwater best on a local level. I agree with that entirely. There's uh, conscientious growers who have water on demand, and that's what we've been talking about. But my experience in the Central Valley is a little different in the fact that the Central Valley has historical pumping rights to groundwater. And the growers there have no incentive to do other than keep pumping at those great rates because at some point they want to sell those rights to the city of Los Angeles. So I'd like some comments on how you equitably handle that for both the grower and the public who's paying for um, misuse of the water. I will agree that the different parts of California and, and the West just generally um, have very different um, patterns of use and um, you know historical traditions of use. Um, you know speaking from the Ventura County standpoint which is the place I know best but I have spent years looking at water issues around the western U US you know we you know, we do very carefully manage the extractions are reported. However, <laughs> the, the flaw in that approach, you know, we've got these structures, we've got these policies, we have, we have the legal framework, um, but 
there's been a historical reluctance to really, really put the bite on pumpers who are over pumping the resource. You know, the, the incentive in our case, the, so there's a single, the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency encompasses more than half the irrigated acreage in, in Ventura County. It sits on top of the, the single biggest, uh, most important aquifer system. If you pump over your allocation, they don't turn your well off, you pay a surcharge, which is an incentive, but water, you know, money in the bank's not water in the ground. We still are not using that money to obtain replacement water or any, anything else, so the, the overdraft condition persists. Um, so, you know, from my standpoint, that's, that's the challenge of the next, you know, 10 years, the critical challenge of Ventura County. Um, is to find a way to, to either bring the supplemental water in, you've got to bring it back into balance. Um, and you know, there are a variety of ways of doing that, but uh, you know, you, yeah, following 10,000 acres of cropland would be one way to do it. I, I wouldn't encourage that as a strategy. Uh, I'd be fired if I did, probably. Um, <laughs> But I don't know. Maybe you can. I, 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 I'm really very shortly that I just simply say you, you're right. I mean, in, in in one respect, you you have to have institutional frameworks to use water. Um, you know, avoid groundwater overdraft. Uh, and um, you know, there are water management districts you can create. There are AB 3030 plans, although they're kind of kumbaya management. And ultimately, there's the power of the court through adjudication. Challenge of being a very very expensive process. Um, however, at the end, I, I would argue that's the the um, you know the best form of management we have. I don't have the time to get into why, but it basically it is that final control of what each entity has. Um, maybe we should start thinking about how we make those adjudication processes cheaper, faster, less painful for for all involved. This is a, I'm I'm finding myself I'm a total novice about water um, uh, and, and many of the issues that you're talking about. Um, Dr. Cram, you, you spoke earlier about Goldman Sachs having a water exchange. Um, with most commodities, I get what's going on. A gold miner mines gold, an oil company uh, brings up oil. Who owns water? Uh -oh. I mean, <laughs> how, what is the ownership? I mean, I can understand people who want to buy it. A lot of people want to buy it. but but. Who are the sellers? Who, who actually owns all this water that's around? How that is that an excellent, excellent question. It's Gentlemen. It's traded as a commodity. Um, it's not only traded directly, but it's traded indirectly. You look at grain trade, that's water trade. Uh, there's a certain amount of water that goes into every ton of grain, and it's different for different crops. Um, so, but, but there is now, uh, an established marketing, uh, uh, you know, tool, a set of investment instruments where people can actually reserve uh, water. But I don't know where it is. See, there's not much quality control. I've done a little bit of digging deep. Um, Brad Newton may want to um, talk about that because we've um, spoken to some of the people that are brokers for water. But I still don't understand where that thousand acre feet resides. Um, but Goldman Sachs is involved, so um, it's got my Well, my yeah, concern. correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but it's, you don't own water itself. You own the right to either use it from a surface water source like a river or to pump it out of a groundwater source. Um, and so it's, it's interesting because you don't, it, it, as far as I understand, you don't actually own the water itself. You, you have the, the right to it, and it's almost... Um, you know, it's almost more like a futures contract, if you're familiar with how those trade, than it is an actual bucket of grain. Is that? Who are the people that actually own those rights? Let, let, let me, let me, let me. Let yeah, me this is for it. the lawyer. Okay. Uh, water code section 102, the very beginning of our <laughs> water code. Okay. All water within the state is the property of the people of the state, but the right to use water may be acquired by appropriation in the manner provided by law. What did that say? That said that. I'll interpret. Water is regulated by the state for maximum public welfare, but the right to use water can be acquired individually, and I would argue to the very ends of my career that that is a property right protected as any other property right, whether or not your car, your house, or any other. It's just subject to a significant public overlay. Now, who owns it? It's agricultural communities, it's cities, it's industry, it's anybody who has perfected a water right under the laws in the manner prescribed by law, as that section said, under the laws of California. So um, 
And then the, 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 the interesting questions come when you know, we need to change adaptive management and claw back some of the water that has been legally acquired, you know, then do you have a takings claim and can you sue for inverse condemnation and all that kind of interesting stuff. But there are individuals that have a, a right to use, not the right to the molecules themselves, but a right to use, it is a property right, and those that have that can put those into an exchange and that is what you're talking about. And I would argue, too, that if it's properly managed and you're not, you are, you're protecting the public interest, the environment, the recreation, other interests, that you want that type of man that, uh, market activity in order to reveal the true price of water, to incentivize conservation, you know, move water between uses so we you know, realize optimal allocation. So if you're using it for beneficial use, it's right. yours. Yeah, well, that's the, be the bare minimum of use. If you're, if you're okay. wasting water, you don't, you don't have a right to waste water. Hmm. You cannot waste. That's right the law. Right back here. First kind of nuts and bolts. Can you comment on reverse osmosis cost, feasibility, and how this fits into your discussion. And the second one is, um, is there any environmental desirability for uh, droughts and catastrophic floods? I'll take a stab at the reverse osmosis thing. There's an, when we talk about, so reverse osmosis is a me method of essentially purifying water. Um, the most expensive water on the planet right now would be desalinated seawater, okay? Um, the cheapest water is conservation. Um, but in between those two things, we're already seeing um, brackish groundwater desalters, much lower energy costs, the TDS, the, the amount of stuff you've got to remove through the purification process, much lower, so the energy inputs are lower, so it's much cheaper. Um, desalinated seawater, you know, is like a couple thousand dollars an acre foot to produce. Um, that's, too, that's too expensive for damn near anybody if there's anything cheaper, and just about everything is cheaper. Um, you can do municipal wastewater using RO, and that pencils out around $1,300, $1,400 an acre foot to produce. Um, now we're getting down into you know, the affordable range. Um, brackish groundwater, um, half that cost. Um, so it's a, it's a technology that's incredibly useful. One of the things we're looking at in Ventura County, because the, one of the consequences of overdraft on the Oxnard Plain is seawater intrusion. We've lost wells <clears throat> along the coast, because as you reduce the pressure in the aquifer, um, which crops out at, uh, at the face of a submarine canyon offshore, seawater pushes its way back into that aquifer and starts, starts contaminating those coastal wells, and, and that's been a problem since the 50s. Um, we spent a lot of money constructing facilities to recharge the aquifers and try to push that seawater back out. We've erected all these, these management strategies and structures to, to regulate water use to try to keep it in balance. The agency that operates the primary recharge facilities, United Water Conservation District, is probably looking at $100 million in capital costs over the next decade. Might it not just be cheaper to stop worrying about the seawater intrusion and just pump the water out of those contaminated wells and treat it so it's usable? It might be. Um, so that's something that's being looked at. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, my background is uh, as an engineer, and uh, just listening to you, you guys, I'm not an expert in this area, but. The, it sounds like the, the farmers and the agricultural people have done a pretty good job in terms of, of you know, making the best use of, of the water that they have. And I would imagine, just guessing off the top of my head, that you know, it would be hard to imagine getting, say, more than a factor of two additional uh, improvement from, from the agricultural uh, techniques that they're using. I mean, you know, they're, they're getting close to, you know, just barely keeping the plants alive, and after that, you, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So, um, the big savings, as far as I, I, I can guess, would be on the consuming end. You know, I, I can see I could save three to five times, you know, uh, the amount of water that I use. In other words, I, I could probably save upwards of uh, sixty to eighty percent. But the problem is the uh, building codes don't allow you to recycle or reuse that gray water, you know, uh, from, from your house. Uh, most of us who've been in California long enough have been through a period where we had to water our plants, you know, with, with stuff from the shower mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the runoff from the sink while you're washing the vegetables. Um, if, if you could, in effect, build that into the house, you could probably save a good 60 to 80 percent of the water and uh, uh, combined with, uh, you know, cutting down on, on you know, things like uh, huge amounts of uh, green grass, you could save a huge amount of water on the consumption end. 
So I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that nobody's talked about this yet. I, let, let, can I make it? I absolutely yeah. agree, but <laughs> yeah, I absolutely agree with everything you said. There are, there, well, in large part, are there are uh, significant savings in the uh, municipal and industrial including residential, of course, use, and that includes cisterns and gray water, and you see municipal codes changing to that effect. Um, there are some interesting aspects. But John knows 80% of the water that is consumptively used in the state is used in agriculture. So if we're talking about the water use at large, um, you, you, you know, you can save, you could double your conservation in m and I and you're only going to really get at, you know, what is that, a 5% savings of the water overall. Um, I don't know what John thinks about this, but I, I will say that ultimately in this state, with, with environmental demands, agriculture demands, and, and, and um, you know, municipal demands, something's got to give. And we, st we do some really inefficient agriculture. We grow alfalfa in the desert using seven acre feet of water. Um, to realize what net profit of five hundred dollars an acre, maybe okay, that at five hundred dollars and that each acre foot times seven is a value in San Diego at sixteen hundred dollars. Something's got to give, and what it is is not going to be that we're not growing strawberries. It's going to be that there's an extra nickel on your gallon of milk because we're going to be growing alfalfa someplace other than the Mojave Desert. Yeah, yeah, and if we can, I mean, per, to me, one of the, I mean the the challenge if we can find a way to have the returns to the growers flow in, in, that, in the right direction. <laughs> so if they do invest more, in, or they do have to pay more for their water uh, and, and plant fewer acres, there's got to be a way for that cost to be passed on to consumers. And right now, it's extremely difficult. You know, most of the commodities we grow, they're, they're traded on a global market. You know, if California strawberries are too expensive, they'll come from Mexico. Because it's you know it costs well ten dollars a day to hire labor down there, not ten dollars an hour. Um, so you know it's very difficult. It's a it's a squishy system. You push down one place and it pops up in another. But that would be that would be great. One of the things when we, I was talking earlier about crop shifts, and um, that's a great point. Not only do we grow alfalfa in the desert, but a lot of the other crop shifts we've seen throughout California have have really hardened the agricultural water demand. It doesn't have the flexibility in the system. You can fallow a cotton field. You can't fallow an almond orchard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a 20-year investment that's going to die if you don't water it. So, and, you know, the nut acreage in the Central Valley has just exploded uh, in the past decade. So we really hardened demand on the, in the agricultural sector in, in, in surprising ways. Uh, John, I thought I heard you say at, at, or, or allude to the notion that for a lot of Ventura County farmers, possibly others, um, there are potential efficiency installations that they could make, but that there isn't enough cash flow to support it. And to me, that always screams of someone who goes into the uh, service providing business or the lease providing business where they own the production and the risk, and then they provide the service for a, a level fee to the people who don't have the capital expenditures. We're doing that in solar. They've been doing that in cogeneration for probably two generations. Did I understand you correctly? And if so, is there are there financial opportunities to do that if you have the savvy? Well, yeah. I mean, I think again, we're talking about a wide range of of different things. But um, specifically, I think what what you probably picked up on was, yeah, if I'm if I have, you know, a lemon or avocado orchard, and it's served by a gravity feed, you know, mutual water company canal, and I have to put in my order for water two weeks ahead of when I get it, and when I get it, it comes for 24 hours, whether I need it for 24 hours or not, and I turn it into my orchard and just let it run through. So if I'm that grower, that system would be so much more efficient if it were pressurized and delivery was on demand, uh, and this person could operate micro sprinklers instead of furrows. But the cost of building those systems, of converting those old, old you know, 100-year-old gravity feed systems to modern pressurized piped, pumped systems is extraordinary. I mean, it's tens of millions of dollars even for the smallest of these systems. 40 million for, yeah. for farmer's system. Yeah. You're thinking of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one of our mutuals. Yeah, it would cost them 40 million bucks. And it's just a couple of dozen maybe unit holders in there. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll never make sense for them to make that investment. Um, it'll get done. 
Unless they were able to get the pricing that would, unless they were able to somehow get the pricing that made it work. We're going to do it. I can talk to you. Yeah, let's, let's, are are we going to take one more here? Yeah, we got one more. Okay. Um, I want to ask John, John from Santa Maria, you were telling us about some technology here, telling me, one of the things I love about this is there's technology that can save some things. Can you give this, our group, a a 60 second download on what you were telling me about what your company is doing? Because it's, it's another sort of example of how technology can, can be a game changer. So I'm going to ask you if you can just tell us what you're doing in Santa Maria. I'm John Riley. Uh, I'm in a company called Vernal Water. Uh, we have a new type of desalination equipment. It's a mechanical device. Uh, we just got a U.S. patent on it. Uh, we got a patent from the Eurasian Federation. And the way it works is that it uh, vaporizes the water mechanically through vacuum distillation and centrifugal force, which separates the vac, the vapor, which is clean rainwater, from the TDSs and other debris uh, through centrifugal force. And uh, it's about, we're projected at half the acquisition costs of RO, one third the operating costs of RO, 20% of the footprint of RO, and 80% production of the intake water. And just to give you an example, uh, our initial batch of equipment would be uh, able to fit into a 20-foot container and produce 1,000 to 3,000 gallons per minute uh, is is the type of volume we're looking at. With power plants could be electric power uh, motors, uh, diesel, natural gas. Uh, One test that has been done uh, was on the flowback water from an oil well with TDSs of 79,974, 80,000, and the water was uh, processed to capture vapor, and it was 670, which meets EPA drinking water standards. So it's a big solution. One thing, uh, speaking about agriculture, that's interesting, and I, uh, I don't know if John was aware of this, but uh, a test was done at UC Davis a while back where they actually measured the production of agriculture crops when the salinity is reduced from the higher levels. And in some cases, you could see a five-fold gain in production, like an avocado, as an example. So if you got clean water going into agriculture, you could get better production. Hmm. Thank you. But incidentally, we're not ready to go into production yet. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all again for coming, and thank you to all our uh, panelists and and to Mark for, uh, for being our keynote.